All right. Hey guys, 1% Better. It's been a long time. Brandon here. I'm finally sitting down and having a conversation now. I am with my friend uh, Matt and recently I posted a poll sort of just gauging what you're interested in hearing about. And there was a lot around sort of mental health, anxiety, depression, loneliness, these really deep topics that, you know, I feel a lot of people in the entrepreneurial space, people making a life for themselves, going out for their own hustle, uh, aren't really talking about. And I have met not just Matt, but a lot of people behind the scenes, and including myself, that have been facing this, uh, you know, on and off. And it's really talked about. So that's going to be a big topic we dive in today. Uh, but also just some general stuff like how we met. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I really hope you enjoy this conversation. We're going to dive deep. Uh, but yeah, for now, we'll just start off like Matt. Um, how how did we meet? Do you, do you remember? What was it? It was, yeah, through Chris the Freelancer's video, right? Yeah, Chris the Freelancer. We did a master class when he was visiting Medellin. Um, and then, yeah, I think you joined the Facebook group. And uh, yeah, we just got to chatting. Yep, things grew from there. And um, I, Chris the Freelancer, just to let you guys know, by the way, um, well, it's pretty obvious. He's like a brand, Chris the Freelancer. He is a freelancer meaning he uh, you know, works remotely and he's been sort of a, yeah, a figure here on YouTube. I'll, I'll put a link in the description if you want to check it out. But um, yeah, at the time I was doing a bit of freelance work for some clients in addition to growing the 1% Better YouTube channel. And um, you know, I was doing like some video work and stuff for some clients through upwork.com. And um, I came across, it wasn't even long into it when I came across Matt's video or his collaboration with Chris. And he was talking about, Sorry, I talked specifically to you, Matt. Matt, you were talking about um, going from freelancer to agency, and it, and it sounds kind of scary, but more so, it was when you got into it and you were describing how, you know, basically going from freelancer to, freelance to agency, you are saving a ton of your time and you're making more money. So it's like, well, who, who doesn't want that? If I ask my audience right now, do you want more time and do you want more money? I think very few people are going to answer no. And so I just made that connection. I thought, okay, seemed like a, a cool guy. And I, 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 I've trusted Chris because I've been following him for about a year or whatever. I've been following him for a while. And um, so, yeah, when you're on there and you had this very calm approach, sort of putting it nice and simply and then talking about systems and processes, which really got my attention and task values, uh, that changed my whole game. And still that's with me today, like putting – almost putting a price on each task you do throughout your whole day and tracking your time and knowing where that time goes. That was a big, big shift for me. And one of the reasons, yeah, like I reached out to you and, and we got connected from there. So that was our basic uh, introduction. Uh, and then I had to go at the whole agency thing. Uh, then it got a little bit messy, but we can, I guess, get to that uh, stuff a bit later on. Um, so Matt, maybe just fill in the audience on like what you're actually doing now, like what's current for you. Yeah, totally. So, uh, yeah, I mean, a little bit about me as well. Like I, back in the day was kind of grew up as a athlete. That was like my whole identity in life until college when I got cut from my team. Um, and that changed everything. And then around senior year, you know, uh, when you're starting to get real about the real world, um, you kind of see two paths, Forming. One is get a job, you know, save for retirement, live for retirement, um, you know, follow the traditional path. And then the other one is something different, right? And uh, I was very much committed to doing something different. And I saw people at the time, I guess the term would be digital nomads, right? Um, and that just kind of completely opened, my, up, opened up my eyes, right? Because I'm like, all right, if this regular looking dude with like weird chest hair uh, can can do it. Why not me, right? Yeah. Um, that was actually Sean Ogle. Shout out to Sean Ogle, one of, one of the OGs, uh, Location Rebel. Um, so yeah, that was basically how it all started. I started a website and blog and just had a dream of one day building a community and a business. And that led me into, uh, I eventually did get a job on the side. I was freelancing. Uh, cause I always knew eventually I would be working for myself. So, um, started freelancing on the side, uh, started an agency, failed an agency while working full time. 
Uh, and then about a year and a half after getting my job, I quit and I moved to Columbia, one-way ticket, that whole deal. Uh, got started freelancing officially. And uh, about a year and a few months later, I managed to um, add you know, a bunch of awesome clients. We managed to break uh, six figures in revenue. And that was really kind of like my first big massive milestone in business. And uh, yeah, since then, um, I've started and grown a few different agencies. And uh, now we're, what we're doing is uh, we're primarily uh, a media brand and community uh, delivering education to creative, specifically freelancers and agencies. And uh, yeah, so that's what we're doing. I'm down based in Medellin where Brandon and I have hung out a little bit. Um, but yeah, you know, it's been a, it's been a fun journey. Um, learned a lot, made a lot of mistakes, had a lot of struggles and, uh, the struggles are, you know, going to be a big part of what we focus on during this video. Um, so yeah. Mm, cool. So let's just, just rewind just a little bit. I want to hear like booking the one way ticket. That's a, that's a big ordeal. And for some people that might be listening right now. They're thinking, wow, like you just booked a ticket and off you went to Medellin. Like that's a big, it's a big jump. So what, what were the things that led up to making that decision and how did you feel making that decision to book that, uh, that one-way ticket? Yeah, so um, mostly people passing away, uh, to be very, you know, frank about it. Uh, I was a, it was a wake up, bunch of wake-up calls. You know, one was uh, Scott Dinsmore, who was a big inspiration for me, inspired me to create different hunger. Um, he was hiking in my, Mount Kilimanjaro at, at age of 33, and the boulder comes down and takes his life. Um, and that was pretty shocking. So that was kind of wake-up call number one. Um, the next wake-up call would be my uh, grandfather. My grandpa passing was another big wake up call right and it was like look time is not slowing down we are very finite as humans right we only have a little bit of time so i couldn't continually show up to my job and be okay with that right you know the the steve jobs quote he's like Every day I would look in the mirror and say, if this was my last day on earth, what would I do, what I'm about to do today, right? And after, you know, saying no enough times, he's like, all right, I got to do something different, right? And that was kind of a, the exact same sort of situation for me. And that quote was pretty inspiring to me. And it was like, look, go for it or just play, play by the the rules of someone else's game, you know? Uh, so, you know, it was, uh, I guess the tragedies in my life forced the urgency and just really caused me to take action. And, uh, you know, I just didn't want to die with regret. Mm. Yeah. It's almost like it comes to a point where it no longer makes any sense to continue what you're doing. Like the, the risk is so high of not doing anything or not changing versus taking the risk of say booking that one way ticket. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, realistically, right? Like I was single 24, 25, like, realistically what is the absolute worst case scenario mm. versus the best case right and when you when you really define the fear that is holding you back you realize that it's just an illusion that's just made up right mm -hmm. because you know worst case scenario i go completely broke and i have to move back in with my parents and i mean i did go pretty much completely broke like multiple times so that happened and you know look i'm still here so what's yeah. up yeah 
Yeah, yeah. I've I've went broke once on this this entrepreneurial climb, and it's definitely not fun. It really does test test you and your fortitude. Like you can you can sit there and be like me, where I just like read personal development books for years, and uh, you know started creating videos on them and sort of parroting along what the ideas were. And there's a lot of value in that. But until you actually you know do go broke and you start getting into these crazy life situations yeah it's uh that's time to put it into practice uh, yeah maybe maybe let's talk a little bit more about being broke i think this is like a, a topic no one really wants to talk about i mean money the topic of money i'm an australian so but, but by just my perception based on uh having american friends and from what i've just heard uh talking about money in america is a bit taboo uh in australia i think it is just a little bit too like there's not people going to dinner parties or like talking about their finances, this is how much I earn, hey, I went broke. Uh, there's like a bit of that, like with close friends and stuff, but it's not really people, you know, something you get taught about, you know, so it's, it's insane. Um, so yeah, being, being broke, like can you recall the first time you went broke, like how that felt, how it affected you and sort of what led up to it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I still think I'm, very broken compared to where I, I want to be or where I will be or, um, you know, I think it's, but like, again, it's, it's just kind of like a state of mind, right? Like there's people that would be considered broke in the Western world that are far happier. Um, but yeah, I mean, when I was in, I mean, Columbia, that was, that was intense because I literally had no, I had one client worth 500 bucks and uh, I literally just spent day and night pitching people on Upwork and emailing and messaging and just trying to get something going. Mm. And uh, it took like two, two months of nothing, nothing going. And then overnight I get like one or two or yeah, I got like two requests for projects and that was it, you know? Um, but yeah, then moving back to New York, you know, moving from Columbia to New York, that's quite the change in uh, expenses and budgeting, right? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, that's not a joke. I had to borrow money from my brother who was in college at the time. Uh, I had to, you know, ask my roommates to spot me a few times on rent payments. Um, but again, it's like, it's one thing to be broke and attached to the money. And then it's another to be broke and detached from the money, <laughs> right? Because if you are judging your worth based on how much money you have, you're fucked, <laughs> right? Um, but if you're able to separate that, and say, look, you know, I took a risk, man. Like I did, I took a risk that most people will die never having taken, <laughs> right? Like I'm, I'm in this for the journey, for the adventure, for the process. And, you know, having the right headspace is going to lead to the money coming and flowing, right? Yeah. So that's kind of how you get out of that situation, right? Um, the way you stay broke is you tell yourselves these negative stories like you're broke because you're a piece of shit <laughs> or, uh, you know, you're broke because you're not worthy. Pain, right? Pain is, is positive. It's a form of feedback that allows you to learn and grow and develop. And you never want to turn away from that because it's essential to your growth, right? So, you know, being broke is uh, you got to go through that because if you don't go through that, you're not going to value the money when you do have it. Right. And it's just a rite of passage like anything. Sure. Good words. And yeah, you look at anyone that's you know, a lot of the people listening right now are probably going for the six figures, right? And uh, You've done that before. Hmm. And so, that's awesome. But, you know, like you said, you've, you've gone like dead broke, like even beyond broke, like maybe even into like, you know, debt, you had to borrow money and things. So that's like beyond broke, right? So that's like the real uh, dark side of it all. But like you said, yeah, two or three times or whatever. And 
I find that's a common thread with uh, like, I've got a bunch of friends who are doing six figures and it's the same thing. Like they've all gone broke. And it's funny, even sometimes uh, like one, uh, one of my friends who does multiple six figures, <laughs> like at times, even he said he feels broke. And, and it's a strange thing. You're scratching your head there. Maybe you're sitting there just trying to get by, like just barely struggling to pay the rent. And you hear someone makes multiple six figures and they feel like they're broke. Like what the hell, like what's going on here? And uh, I was puzzled too. I was scratching my head. But I think there's sort of two components to this. There's the, the on the one thing, your relationship with money. That's one thing, like your mindset basically. And then the second thing is, is a lot of people fail to consider taxes and business expenses. So they're always looking at, you know, pre-tax income. But, you know, tax will take 50%. Most people just don't factor that in. And then you've got all the expenses. But, yeah, and so there's a... Yeah, you'll be surprised. Like, if you're doing 200k a year or whatever, like a big chunk of that's gone. You know, 100k yeah. into tax, and then maybe your margin like 50 percent. So half of that's gone into the business, and you're just left with a you know a normal income. It's not really six figures, or even multiple yeah. six. Figures. Um, but yeah, uh, also the the relationship uh, with money is an interesting one. Um, Maybe let's dive into that a little bit more. So there's definitely uh, positive ways of, like, when you are flat broke, emotions are going to come up, and you're going to be struggling to meet your basic survival needs, which puts seems to put stress on the body, and then you start getting anxious. Your mind starts coming up with all these future scenarios. So what do you think is, like, uh, like what maybe – you, maybe you agree or disagree with me here, but how – I don't think the, the goal should be to like tell yourself that, okay, I'm in a situation, blah, blah, and you're just going to feel like elated and happy and, and positive. Like, I don't think that's the way, but it's still, there's still like a stoic approach I think you can take to when you're in that situation that's being broke that allows you to make the steps that will take you, uh, you know, from going broke to having money again to make basic survival needs. Cause it's, I've just found in my experience, it's pretty damn hard to, uh, you definitely can't approach it with a stoic attitude, but to expect that you're just going to feel elated. Oh, I've got all this. I think is pretty difficult, but maybe you disagree with me here. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? If that makes any sense. Um, yeah. So thoughts on like how, how to behave like, how to feel when you have money or when you don't or what in particular did you mean? So like when you're, when you're flat broke, can you change your mindset so that in such a way you feel like you are non, no longer broke and you have no problems or does the problem and challenge still remain there? But because of changing your mindset, now you can actually take the steps to get out of that broke. Like, well, how will you feel when you're broke? Is it possible to just feel happy, elated, and just be okay with it all the time or not? Um, yeah, I mean, you want to ideally uh, get to a state where the external world can't really affect you internally, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so anti-fragile is a term that a lot of people use. And it's uh, talking about stoicism, like Marcus Aurelius says, uh, it can only ruin your life if it can ruin your character, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, with that sort of approach, everything is just an opportunity and a challenge, right? Gotcha. So, you know, if, if you're broke, there's probably a good reason for it, right? Yeah. You know, you're not, do you're not doing the right things. You're not thinking the right way. You're not behaving the right way. And it's just feedback, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, lean into that and approach it objectively versus emotionally. Mm -hmm. Because when you get into the emotions, that's when everything becomes distorted and you start thinking out of, you know, your thinking is just clouded, right? Sure. So, you know, I think the the people that can be happy and grateful during the worst times are going to be great for the long term game, right? Uh, you know, everybody gets flustered and everybody has challenges, 
that's normal, but it's really about your ability to bounce back and be resilient during those times. Um, so, you know, that's kind of like the main thing. It's like, you know, you're broke for a reason, right? Like you're not broke because of anything else other than yourself. I mean, you know, like, sure, there's, there's maybe some environmental factors, but at least for me, like I choose to take full responsibility for, you know, where I'm at in my life and people that kind of blame external factors, you know, saying things like, oh, I was born here or I grew up here or I, I didn't go to this school or that, that school. I mean, that's just, that's just a dangerous mentality. That's a sort of victim mentality that's going to really sabotage you. So, um, so yeah, whenever you're feeling that way, it's just about being objective, getting like real data, right? Like, what are you spending your time doing? Right? Like, what are you thinking about? Right? You know, where's your head at? Right? You got to really be objective with these things to, to understand what has to change, you know? Yeah. Sure. I think that's great. And I've got, I think I, I brought this up because I was a little bit jaded as I, when I first got into like self development, I started believing that if I just applied all this self development stuff, I would feel good all the time. But that's not true. Like you said, pain is necessary. Pain is there to tell you something. It's there to teach you something. And so I thought if I could just pick up or read, read the right life inspiration quote, like it'll go away, but it's no, like be there, be aware with it, feel it, yeah. and then start working to do whatever you have to do to get back to a nice baseline state or whatever. So like just diving into one episode I had uh, a year ago or something, whatever it was now, time's flowing. Um, like after I went broke, I flew back home to Australia to move in with my family because I was broke. Like it was either that or be on the streets in another country in the world. So I didn't want that. And so I actually had to, like, I just, I lost the plot. I remember stress was the first thing that happened. Like I can clearly make a, a distinguish, a, a distinction between what anxiety is, what stress is and what depression is. They're all sort of in a similar category on this sort of down low side, but I can see like the difference between all of them. I experienced all three in like this wave. It was crazy. Um, but stress was the first thing. Uh, my head just throbbing. There was heat. Uh, and I remember just like my mind started, uh, I don't know if I'd say racing, that's more anxiety, but like it was compact. It was hard. It was um, hot. So, like it was warm. Like, and I, I, yeah, I was sort of in this like fight off, flight mode like again that sort of I guess sounds like anxiety maybe that was coming into it gradually but stress it was just I couldn't function and the funny thing about stress is you really it, it changes the way you think completely and the thing about it yeah. is like in my experience it's quite subtle like you think you're thinking straight but you're probably not and I remember like I sent this stupid and I was over in Columbia actually and I, I sent this just mean Instagram message to this guy following my stories and I thought I was like the you know, the, I'm, I'm, this is tough advice, you know, suck it up type thing. But no, I was just an asshole. And like, that's very rare for me, at least. Yeah. Like I just, that's completely out of character for me. I'm normally a very calm yeah. guy. I like to think so. Very calm and, and just gentle. But yeah, this time, like when I was under lots of stress, I was really working hard and I was looking at my bank account draining, like, yeah, stress just got to me. And I just, yeah dumb shit like that and I didn't realize till months later when I came out of my stress that I go oh wow I was an asshole so yeah sorry to that that dude uh sorry I forgot your name I really apologize I was yeah you know funny well but anyway so the stress started building up and um my mind was telling me I was broke as fuck uh and I wasn't quite broke yet like I, I was okay but like the stress just completely took over my mind and I, I was just convinced I was broke and I didn't see it until I broke out of it three months later uh, so I was like bringing my friend, I was in tears, I was crying, like it was bad. I was, yeah, I sold all my cameras, like I thought I was going to like be stranded overseas. It was horrible. Um, and yeah, so I just sold my cameras for real cheap. I didn't care, I just needed money. Uh, and then I even had to borrow some from um, one of my friends. And yeah, you kind of feel guilty when you, uh, and this was my experience, I felt a bit guilty being like a taker, going from the giving guy who's running the self-development YouTube channel uh, to having lots of people tell him that, hey, they've like, you know, I've changed your life and you've been a positive influence, to now being this guy where I feel like I'm in this vulnerable 
low value position where I'm like, yeah. I have to take, and I found it hard to yeah ask for help when I needed it. Uh, but I did, luckily, I, I pushed through it and I did ask for help and I got the help I needed just like that. My good friend, Stephen, shout out to Stephen. Thank you. That guy has saved me a few times in my life now. Uh, such a great guy back in the unicycling days when I used to ride a unicycle. Um, but yeah, he's <laughs> simple, like, you know, my mind made up all these things like, oh, he's gonna, he's gonna like see you as less and all this crap. But no, he's just like out of love, just sent it to me. You've paid me back before, Brandon. Uh, here you go, done. And that was it. And then I booked my flight back home. Um, and then another five months of mild depression came up, anxiety. And so that was just talking about stress and going broke. But then, yeah, there's more in anxiety and depression, which followed after that. And it took me a whole, like a good six months of uh, recovery from that. So, yeah, I mean, we could dive into uh, anxiety or depression a bit more. Like maybe you've got some experiences here that you want to share specifically about these two topics. Uh, I'd be interested to hear sort of like what you don't see behind the scenes, you know, like in this entrepreneurial world where, Everyone's hustling, go to the hustle. Like, what, what aren't we seeing, Matt? I'm curious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, everything is taboo. And, like, a- anything that's in darkness is going to, you know, fester, right? It's going to lead to problems, right? Because if we can't be comfortable enough to talk about these things, then we're suppressing that pain, you know, then we're turning to substances to numb the pain, right? Like I've had, I've had problems before where, you know, there wasn't enough weed in my bowl uh, to just escape, right? Because that's really what we're, what we're doing. You know, it could be, it could be alcohol, it could be drugs, it could be sex, it could be gambling, it could be eating, right? Like, Whenever you start doing things and you're not doing them for the enjoyment of doing them, you're rather doing them to escape, that's when you want to really take a step back and kind of understand like, okay, what's really going on? Because you're really just, you're, you know, you're running a program, right? You're, you're like what you were talking about when you were dealing with a lot of stress, you can't think coherently in that state, right? So, you know, when you're in that state, you, the human, you're basically being controlled by your body and your automatic programming, you know? So that's, that's an indicator that something's going on, right? And, you know, for me, again, it's like I've had issues with, um, with that, you know, like with using different substances, some ganja, like I said. Um, and you just have to kind of, again, be very objective and have self-awareness and also get help, right? Like after a certain point, you know, you just got to get a third party involved because, you know, there's, there's the story that we tell ourselves and then there's reality, right? And when you're in a very emotional place and a very vulnerable place all you are able to process is the story and the emotion and the stress and the fear and the shame and the guilt so you have to break free of that and if you are you know alienating yourself because you feel so bad then you have nobody else to say hey you know what's going on, right? Like, yeah. Brandon, you're, you, you're usually so generous and grateful and happy. What's going on? You know, I can sense something's up. And like, sometimes that, even just that little bit of awareness is all it takes to kind of start the healing process and, and begin the reprogramming process, as I like to call it. Um, so yeah, you know, it's it's just so important that like we stop telling ourselves this these stories because the stories keep us trapped, right? Like your your story was, "Oh my god, I have a 300,000 person YouTube channel about personal growth 
and I can't even, you know, get out of my own way. Like I'm such a failure, but the reality is you're just human, right? Yeah, like right. I'm just, you know, and like, you know, for me, like I've like, we help freelancers and agencies growing their businesses. And, you know, I've surely had enough problems with my own business and it's been like, well, wow, like I'm such an imposter. I'm such a failure. I'm such a joke, but it's, that's just the story. That's not reality. Right? Like right. we, it's not like either of us have evil intentions, you know, we're, we're, we're doing all of this out of love and the judgment and the self judgment is really what really just kills people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've never met even people in my close circle. Like I met a lot of people along my travels, business, just in life in general. And I've never come across someone where there's this, even if it looks picture perfect on social media, uh, I know this might sound, you know, cliche to say, and it's being said more often recently, but yeah, like you look behind the scenes, you pull the curtain and I'm not saying everyone's like struggling like crazy, but like things come in waves very often. And there's a lot of external factors. I mean, in the world, you get hit by a hurricane and it can put you into a, you know, it can make you go broke and then you start experiencing that pain. So it's not like all, always smiles. Um, you can still maintain that attitude yeah. of, okay, what can I do about this? But you'll never find like someone who's just happy, like happy, smiling, like 24 seven on the beach with the laptop, smile, smile, smile. Uh, like it's just, yeah. it doesn't happen. Everyone faces challenges. That's, that's all I'm trying to say. And uh, it can be very difficult to lose sight of that. Yeah. In this age of social media, um, which I definitely use too much right now. I will admit, <laughs> scroll, scroll, scroll through the Instagram stories. Um, yeah. it's nice a little bit, but yeah, it is a bit excessive. Um, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation, isn't it? Social media alone too. <laughs> totally. Geez. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, and it's like, like you said, like, and, and I think this is a big thing that the world has to really accept is that like depression is part of the human experience, right? Like depression does not mean that there's something wrong with you, <laughs> right? Like depression is just another form of pain that's telling you something that is you know, off that needs to be changed or tweaked or adjusted. You know, it's a, it's maybe a belief system or a behavior or a thought pattern, right? Like there's nothing wrong with you. Right. And, and yeah. the, the chronic, the chronic state of that stress and that depression and that anxiety is the problem. Right. Right. But just, just having that, you know, feeling that way, doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. And I think that's something that everybody has to really understand and realize yeah. because, you know, we want to just rush to get a prescription or, you know, like label ourselves. But in reality, like you're just going through a human experience. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't think there's any human being on earth that hasn't at some point felt depression and all of the byproducts of that state and stress and whatever. Yeah. Um, but again, when nobody's talking about it, it's easy to tell yourself that story. And that's why, you know, people like you and I, Brandon, you know, like instead of talking about the glam, the glam life, like let's talk about some real shit so that people can actually, you know, be not alienated, but feel connected. Right. Yeah. Um, because again, when you're in that place, it's like, it's like you're, there's something wrong with you. Like you're different. You are separate from everyone else. Nobody understands. And that's a dangerous place to be as we know. And as the Western world is seeing now, um, so it's important that we realize like, look, it's all just part of the journey, you know? Mm-hmm. Sure. And to really, really, so, uh, sorry, go on, go on. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it's like, I think everybody on earth has the capacity to be happy. And I think everybody has been happy at some point. Yeah. Right. But 
if they're not happy and they, for some reason, can't be happy, then something, you know, in their programming just needs to be adjusted and changed and tweaked. Um, and, you know, both of us have openly struggled with this stuff. And, you know, I'd like to think we're both, at least now, you know, feeling really good and, and happy and upbeat and energetic and grateful. Yep. That's not to say we're not, we're not going to feel these things again. But again, it's just about snapping out of that um, and, you know, sort of doing what you need to do to sort of like get back into the positive upswing of things, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, what, what did you feel like, what, what were some things that, you know, you did that helped you kind of come out of that dark spot, you know? Yeah, yeah, and this is, I think, where the real nuggets of conversation are. Because right now, to an outsider listening to this, it may sound kind of sort of vague, but if we now get into, okay, what are like the steps you really have to take to take yourself from, I'll describe how I felt when I had anxiety, for example, but depression, anxiety, major stress, are all sort of in a similar category, uh, different things in my experience. But let's just talk about my, my anxiety experience, what it actually felt like, what it really felt like, what it looks like, the specifics because uh, perhaps this is how someone is experiencing it too, who's listening to this. Uh, and then what steps I, I personally took, what my sort of experience was and, and go from there. So, uh, yeah, I remember after I was broke and I had a lot of stress and I flew back home, uh, my whole entrepreneurial mindset pretty much like just vanished. And I, I had had that mindset for three or four years, the whole stoic entrepreneur, uh, never work a job again type thing. Uh, like that was completely eradicated. Like a, a classic nine to five job, like was completely out of question. Like I was fully just in the entrepreneurial zone. Like, and I thought it was permanent. But after that anxiety attack and going broke and all that scare and fear coming up, that developed into a, a mild sort of depression where it was very hard to function. So you know, like waking up in the morning it was a, it was a big task to get out of bed. Uh, and I just didn't see a way forward and my energy, like my physical, like it's a really physical experience, just, just energy is gone. It didn't matter if I drank, so, like it, it does matter to drink water. It does give you a bit of energy, but like when you're depressed, you kind of forget to drink water, uh, and stay hydrated or you just can't be bothered. Like it's such a task to do the little things. Uh, I think that's a common thread for a lot of people who describe what depression is like. Uh, and it crept up on me a little bit too. I didn't realize oh, this is like all the symptoms of mild depression until I, uh, yeah, made the connection. Um, and yeah, I, uh, disclaimer, I, I didn't get like an official diagnosis, uh, but it was pretty, pretty damn obvious yeah, looking back. Um, yeah, and so like I was sluggish, my, my brain was just fuzzy and just like a little bit of a dark cloud. It wasn't like a full-blown severe depression, which I, I've experienced once in my life, which is a three-week period. And it was the most horrific, hell blazing just most treacherous place i've ever been in my life and like when i had that experience like this was three years ago back when i was studying in university and i also had a financial issue um i just lost it and yeah i mean that was the darkest thing i can't even begin to put that into words how how scary that was uh, but anyway this was like a, a mild sort of depression so a lighter version of that but still quite tough right so um, then, then the anxiety sort of came along. So it sort of transitioned from this mild depression to anxiety. Now, anxiety for me was, it was a bit more slow and dark and it was a bit more, a bit more in the stress sort of mind racing, buzzing, getting agitated, being worried about things that aren't there and just losing, almost losing my mind. Uh, just like, zzz, like I had six cups of caffeine, couldn't focus. Uh, and just this worry for no reason. Uh, it was it was scary. Like yeah, it was really scary. And often when there was like nothing really like that wrong, like I needed friends to keep me in check, just to say, hey Brandon, yes, you've you've encountered a difficult financial situation, but look, I mean, you're back with your family now. You've got a safe place. People love you. Like there isn't actually a whole lot going wrong. But yeah, you'll find with other people who have experienced anxiety, describe the same things. Like your body just goes into this mode where it thinks there's something wrong with it. There isn't really, yeah, maybe there's a bit that you've got to address, but it, it completely blows it out of proportion. So, you know, I'm talking, I'm laying on a mattress at the time because there's no rooms left in the house because they're all full up. So I'm out in the living room sleeping on this, this shitty mattress, but still grateful to have it, but it was sort of hard to see gratitude at the time. 
Um, but yeah, I still tried my best and sort of like this. I remember I slept in the shed one, uh, one night, like it's so out of character for me. It was a cold day and I, it was, I was freezing out there. I was like sleeping in the freezing cold in this cold shed with no insulation. And the only reason I did it was because my other family members, just the tiniest noise they made at night playing a video game, clicking a mouse, it just completely zapped my mind like my my body couldn't handle it like it was too much stimulation i'd get a bit frustrated and a little bit angry and this wasn't normal for me when i'm in my baseline state like this is anxiety at its at its it's worse it was horrifying uh, i even talked about the dropping the whole business entrepreneurial stuff and just going straight back to a job i don't know what i was doing so i applied for a sales job i uh, didn't enjoy it we were selling something i wasn't i didn't care about and i, I didn't think the practices were good did that for a day and i'm like I just, yeah, first day I quit at the end of it, I was out. Uh, but I can't believe I did that. Like, uh, but my, my mind, was just, I lost my mind. I, I just lost it. Um, so that's, that's, yeah, going really deep into the experience. Maybe, hopefully some 1% better fans are resonating with this right now. Um, so now, like, moving on into, like, okay, so when I thought things were hopeless, I completely lost my mind. Like, how do you recover from this situation? And I think, yeah, when people go into these states, and you experience all that emotion, you lose sight of any sort of solution. It's very difficult. Uh, but the thing is, you do have uh, a strong degree of control. There are things that you can do no matter how bad it feels. You, you have the power to do something about this. Um, so trying to think back in terms of actually how I came out of it. I mean, I did what a lot of people would do, which is just go, let's go straight to Google. Ah, shit, I got anxiety. What do I do? How do I feel better now? Like, like who doesn't do that? Uh, you don't want to feel like anxious. Um, but I think like one thing I started trying was I'm like, okay, I feel like crap. I see no vision for the future and I don't know what that looks like right now, whatever. But what I do know now is if I exercised, right, as opposed to not exercising, this is me really trying to be objective and just taking a step back. So it starts with that awareness, like, okay, like step out, be the knower, or whatever the Buddha say, be the knower. You can step out at any time uh, and sort of zoom out. And so I'm like, okay, I'm feeling all these things. Brandon's feeling all these things, but what can you do? Um, and so it just came to me like exercise, you know, there's some studies on it or whatever. But I thought, okay, well, the benefits of exercising as opposed to not exercising, even if I don't feel like it, it's probably going to move me like in a, in a positive direction. Uh, I think I did address like, okay, why am I having anxiety in the first place? Uh, and I did some like journaling and things like that. So I think it's important sort of identifying, okay, what's the root cause of this? Like that's, that's what I, I tried to do. Um, but I couldn't really find any answers. Um, I didn't, it didn't seem to be doing much. So I thought, okay, I don't know the answers. I'm just going to exercise because that's good for you. It's good for your brain chemistry. Like, let's just do that. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, even when I didn't feel like a, I just made the task so small, uh, even if yeah. I was a walk for five minutes if that's all i could do that day that's what i would do um so for the next yeah 30 days i would go out on a daily walk occasionally miss a day but not beat myself up so again that's just being aware you might automatically yeah. do it, but be aware if you start bad talking yourself it's okay like this is this is the wave whatever uh you do your best the next day or whatever um and just make it small that's okay and so that's what i did for the next 30 days exercising and um that for me is what slowly helped build a bit of like morale and started getting my mind back together um, just by like doing something positive. And it was like positive reinforcement because for so long, for many months before I just finally made the decision to do something about it and not get wish washed in it. Like I was, you know, playing video games 16 hours a day and just eating junk food, masturbating and, even, I hate to admit this, this is one of the parts of the video where I like, can't believe I'm saying it on camera. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, it's really difficult. Like, my family doesn't really watch my videos, but if they do, here it is. I, oh, man. <laughs> I, 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 like, for the first time, I became, like, a bit deceptive to my family. Now, dr drug addicts, we'll talk a lot about this, how they just, their moral character disappears. It completely goes out the window in pursuit of drugs, like it doesn't matter. Uh, and so mm. I'm not saying like I was shooting up heroin, I wasn't doing any of that. I wasn't that far down, but uh, like I had ordered some, like behind my family's back and I'd get these parcels in the mail, right? 
And I, even my sister brought me some parcels and she goes, what's in there? And I go, oh, you know, just some like stuff, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I just kind of dodged it a little bit. I was just a bit weird about it. And normally I show her my packages, but she might've got a bit sus, but whatever. She just kept going on about her life. It was a bit weird. So these packages were coming in the mail, right? And so you're probably wondering like, what's in these packages? And what it was, was I was secretly like going off. I felt like a, I just felt strange. I felt like I was, I don't know, like, just weird. I was this shady dude, like now entering the drug world. And what I do is I go to a chemist warehouse in Australia. And this is completely legal, by the way, this part of it is. Uh, I would go into a chemist warehouse and buy uh, <laughs> of the cough syrup stuff. It's kind of like, mm. not a lot of people actually know about this, which is why there's a bit of a community around it in the Reddit underground. But DXM, dextromethaphan, um, this is a specific brand. If, if you get the right bottle at the right place, you can get this stuff, which is actually acts as a disassociative. I'm not recommending this, by the way, full disclaimer. But it acts as a disassociative, uh, a, bit like, a bit like ketamine, but, yeah, much different. Mm -hmm. you know, I was just so far down that I couldn't see a future. I just thought, I'm just going to feel good now, whatever I can do. So let's go and like, try this DXM shit. I'm actually not a big fan of alcohol. A lot of people would drink alcohol in the situation, but I turned DXM because I'm more interested in psychedelics. Uh, and so I thought, how can I kind of abuse psychedelics and have a psychedelic experience without the difficulties of getting into the illegal way and getting LSD and like doing all this illegal stuff. It was a little bit much. So I thought if I can just go to the store and get some DXM, uh, hell yeah. Uh, so I went off in my car and I lugged it back and just, hit it under my clothes or whatever, like when I walked into the house, hide it from family members. And then, yeah, on some nights when it was really late, everyone was, yeah, in bed, I would whip out the DXM and drink excessive amounts of cough syrup to, to blast away. Uh, it just felt weird. And then, and especially, here's, here's the thing that really got me. It was because I was basically lying and being deceptive. That was the biggest issue. It wasn't taking the substance uh, if you want to try some DXM, I'm not going to recommend it, but I mean, anyone can do it. And if you're in a healthy state of mind and you're not doing it to escape, sure. I, I think it's, it's pretty cool to experience at least once, but again, like do your own research. Uh, yeah, probably not for everyone. You want to do your own research right? risk involved. So do be weary, not recommending anything. Um, but yeah, it was becoming like deceptive. And then the next thing it got worse and I started ordering these NOS canisters. Uh, I think it's kind of like popular in the UK. If there's any Brits watching, let me know. But like in the party scene, they blow these balloons up with nitrous. Yeah. And, and uh, apparently they're legal too. So I thought, oh, all these like legal things that I've never heard about, like this alcohol and cigarettes, but they don't really appeal to me. But what about, okay, DXM and this, this NOS, like what you can order these canisters from like a cooking store and then buy this canister thing and put a balloon on and like get super high. I like, that was like the best thing ever to me at the time. So I would get more parcels in the mail with these little canisters and um, I just lug them down to the shed. And I even got to a point where I was going so like crazy with it, full ham that I, I was trying to like, like orgasm and masturbate at the same time as getting the, the NOS high by inhaling the balloon and just seeing how high, how high I could get. Like, I just didn't care anymore. I just didn't care. And that's the scary thing. When you just stop caring about moral character, even stop caring about what you're doing, like behind your own family's back. It's just a weird situation. Knowing you're like yeah. down in this shady shed, shirt off, fapping away, like ordering all these like drugs. Like it's just uh, like yeah. what the hell when you really zoom out, wow. Like, <laughs> but it is what it, it is what it was, or it is what it is at the time. So um, that's just how I was experiencing things at the time. So, so be it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's like my real vulnerable share. That was pretty, yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty low point. But it was shortly after that that I, yeah, I think there was one point where I, like, I was sitting there after having a bunch of nuts and going to the moon that I thought, wow, like this is, this is weird. Like, what are you doing here, Brian? Like that was, that was weird. And then it was like a, just a slow, gradual process of continuing the exercise. And then also my buddy ringing me up and asking if I want to take on a client. And at the time, hell. Like when we were on the call, like to close the client, my anxiety just went through the roof and that's when it peaked. Oh, like how the hell am I going to close the yeah. call when I've lost all direction in my life? I have no energy. My YouTube skills out of date because I've been like depressed and gone broke and like my mind was a mess. 
But um, mm. I just pushed through it. I decided. I made the decision in spite of these feelings. And I don't know the future. I'm going to push through. I'm going mm. to push through, like, in spite of what I don't know. And I'm glad I did. Like, the first few weeks, it felt like shit. And it wasn't even my ideal client. So it's kind of like slagging away again. But at least I... I uh, I felt like there was just a, a little bit of progression, you know? And so for me, it was just those very small stepping stones that starts with awareness, then making a decision, yeah. and then slowly, small gains. Uh, in my experience, that is uh, what worked for me and got me to climb out. And it was when I booked the ticket back out of home, like staying in my home environment, sort of, I have all these relationships in my mind with oh you're the yeah. millennial at home and you're broke like you're worthless basically and so booking a flight was actually which what like really like got me back on track and may maybe i could have got back on track without booking the flight by changing my mindset i don't know but um that's that's what worked for me just to yeah make those small steps the exercise the client and then finally booking that flight it's like, oh, I could think again, like I was clear. So that's that was my that was my experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, how about that? I mean, mm. first of all, thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Second of all, I don't know if I can top you with any of those stories. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, but but yeah, I mean that's some stuff, right? Like I mean, you know, like it definitely wasn't like a positive evolution of your brain and body and, you know, being, right? Like it's definitely a downgrade. Um, and I, you know, that's just what is the case, right? When When we're in these confused, like, completely incoherent places <laughs> you know what i mean um but i mean first of all it's amazing you were able to get out of that and can now share that because i mean look like i'm sure a lot of people can relate to that story in a lot of different ways mm -hmm. um so yeah dude i mean that's great and like something as simple as just exercising and like taking a walk can just kind of flip the switch and get you that little bit of like positive energy and momentum. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, that's like everything, you know, just like baby steps to get out of that spot. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Um, yeah. Where do you want to take this? Uh, I was thinking, Maybe a bit of talk on just like social, if you want to talk about this or something else, let me know, but social, social media. Um, I think it's such a prominent, prominent thing in people's lives and we don't yeah. quite realize uh, just the amount of influence it's having on it. It has yeah. more positive and negative influences. There, there is both sides of the story. Uh, but right. Let's dive into, I guess we can dive into both, but the negative first and then the positive aspects of it. Uh, but yeah. I'll start off by saying, like, YouTube, right? Uh, I know a lot of my audience is I'm in their early 30s. And it's pretty common for them to go in their bed at night and scroll through YouTube for a few hours, uh, whatever it is. And sometimes throughout the day, you might watch a YouTube video, but usually in the evenings, right? So you're in bed, uh, you're kicking back, watching some YouTube videos, and, you know, you have goals and stuff. You're into self-development. Um, maybe you're doing some freelancing right now or looking at starting an agency or, you know, you, you've got some, you want to afford your own financial path or whatever, and you want to take charge of your life, right? Um, so you're into all this stuff and so you, chances are you probably watch Grant Cardone, Dan Locke, uh, all these like Gary Vee, um, like pretty much everyone listening will resonate with at least one of those names They're on YouTube everywhere, right? Um, and so we watch them uh, to like improve ourselves. Um, you know, we learn from Dan Mark about doing sales. We learn from Grant Cardone about you know hustling, ten xing it, you know, all this stuff. Um, but just sharing a bit of my a bit about my thoughts on this. Um, yeah, I think I think this is great. Um, it's great content. You can you can learn a lot. I think the trap is is when it becomes excessive consumption. Okay, so this is there's quite a few things to this. 
One is excessive consumption. The amount of stuff you're watching and taking in from other people is so disproportionate that you forget to listen to yourself. Okay, there is a balance. There is a healthy balance. Um, because if Grant Cardone's like 10 xing and like, or Gary V, he's a classic example. Um, <laughs> although his intentions are good, uh, a lot of people have already shared this already, but people like watching him without any awareness will feel like they have to like hustle as hard as Gary and basically be Gary right. and hustling, blah, blah, blah. And I know Gary has kind of addressed this, uh, you know, maybe last year or whatever. Uh, but I think it's important to bring up again that uh, just because Grant's doing this or Dan Lott's doing this or says this, it doesn't necessarily mean you should. And the timing yeah. is right in your life as well. Like what, what one message might res resonate with you only three years later might not resonate with you at all. And that's okay. It's, it's a matter of knowing yourself and taking bits and pieces um, that do and that are relevant to you. So that's one thing. Excessive consumption, be careful of that. Listen to yourself. And the second thing is, is you're only getting a preview of like their, their, their lives and their knowledge and their experience. Like they've lived for 30 years in this game, in this business game, this life game. And what you're seeing in a 10 minute video is just like, yeah, you can get some great stuff from it for sure. Just like this actual recording we're doing now. But you, you need to be aware that this is just like a 10 minute preview and it's a compressed version of what's actually what they've actually lived out and everything so that's just something to keep in mind it's not like you watch one video and that's a be and be all end all solution to your business problem or your life problem or your struggle um you know at, at the end of the day it comes back again i think in my experience to listening to yourself a little bit more doing some journaling you know what what switches me on what doesn't where does my energy flow where it has been a bit of stuff like that i think it's it's very important and to be careful of this excessive consumption um, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of other forks in the road here that we could go down. So I'd love to hear uh, your story, and then we can perhaps move into some of the uh, what are the positive factors too. But first, I want to hear like, like, what's your experience with social media, and what do you feel are kind of the negative aspects of it? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a tool. Uh, I think it's important to remember that that you know, it's a piece of technology and a tool that if not used properly can cause harm, right? And I think a lot of the problems with it are based around the fact that it's designed to be an addictive tool uh, that, you know, just reinforces these dopamine loops um, that just, you know, like it's just instant gratification times a hundred thousand right and um that's damaging right because if you're let's say an entrepreneur and you got to work and like put in the work and like show up and you've got to really delay your gratification for sometimes months usually years or longer um that's going to be hard to do when you're just accustomed to boom like I, I want it and I got it, right? Like, r like everything's on demand and that's dangerous because again, we're programming our minds and bodies to expect what we want when we want it, exactly how we want it, right? Yeah. Um, and that's just not, that's just not reality. Um, outside of this, you know, the device. So like that's, that's harmful because it also shortens our attention spans and like nobody can pay attention. Like nobody can concentrate and focus and do really great work because they're just so distracted all the time. Right. And, you know, that shows up in so many different areas, right? Like it's, it's crazy. It's like, I think it's something like four or five years of our lives are spent looking down at our phones at this point. Um, which that sounds pretty, that sounds pretty low, honestly. <laughs> um, cause you know, if you just look outside at like literally any place where there's people walking, like 50% of them at least have their heads down looking at the phone. Um, so, you know, you've got to be in control of the technology. 
Um, if you are not, and you are just mindlessly opening up, hitting F on your browser, hitting enter, going to Facebook, scrolling through, going on your phone, Instagram, you know, you're being controlled and programmed by the technology. And that is not where humanity is going to thrive and create and uh, solve the world's biggest problems because we're just like brainwashed, you know? Um, so we really have to be conscious of how we use it, when we use it, and why we use it, right? Because like half the time you find yourself five minutes later, you don't even know why, <laughs> why you opened the app, right? Mm, and that's, yeah, totally. you know, like everyone can relate to that. Like we're all guilty of that. Um, but it has to change, right? Like we've got to be able to take control of that and be conscious. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my take on it. Mm. And so what would that look like in terms of action steps? So let's say you become aware of this behavior and you're conscious of it. Like what could someone do right now today? They go, Oh yeah. Like I spend, I must spend four, four hours a day on social media and maybe, maybe it's even more and they don't even realize it. But, um, Coming into yeah. with this awareness, like what does someone then do? Because it, it seems like, you know, everybody, everybody, all our friends are on social media, everyone's there. And to just completely detach yourself, it's a very hard thing to do. And is it even practical? Yeah. Like this is what runs through my mind even because I, I definitely use it excessively. And so you, you got all these questions that come up and then like, uh, do I just throw my phone out altogether? Do I like, what, what do you do? What do you reckon? Yeah. So, I mean, like what I've, what I've done and what's been helpful for me is to set constraints okay. for usage. Um, so, I mean, that's one. Then other is to just delete the apps from your phone. Cause like you can access them from the web and, uh, for the most part have a similar experience. But anyways, like the first thing I would say would be setting constraints, right? So it's like, all right, you know, how much time are you willing to invest in social media every day and every month and every year? Like think about it in terms of your lifetime, right? Like how much time are you willing to invest? Um, and you know, for me, it's, it's not going to be more than 20 minutes a day or 30 minutes a day. Right. Like that's maximum. Um, so I would just set that constraint. Um, Apple's come out with some really cool features on the iPhone that allow you to do that. You can actually set uh, time limits. You can like shut down all of the apps from a certain time to a certain time. Yep. Um, but, you know, so that's, that's an, a great example of like, you know, technology that's helping us be more conscious as opposed to less conscious, mm. um, which is awesome um, to see. So, yeah, I mean, one would be, again, set a constraint. I think everybody can get out their social media uh, fixing for in half an hour to an hour a day. I mean like set aside a time like every day at 12 o'clock or four o'clock or three o'clock. I'm just going to go and scroll through until I can't scroll anymore, you know? Um, or I'm going to just reply to comments. I'm going to look through posts, whatever, like that's cool. Um, and that makes you be more intentional with your time because you have a constraint, right? Um, the other thing would be like, like you really don't want to go through social media first thing in the morning because that just like scrambles all your brain waves. Um, like absolutely wait to go through that until after you have some sort of morning routine, some sort of mindfulness exercise like meditation or gratitude or breath work or anything. Um, but yeah, that would be kind of like my two tips or so um, that I've found really helpful. And then, the third one with Apple's latest update um, was basically turning off the, all the apps and stuff from 10 PM to the next morning uh, after I've done my routine. So, um, so yeah, those are just some kind of 
quick tips. Oh, thanks for the value. And I'll try and yeah. just add some extra ones. And one yeah. is downloading Facebook newsfeed eradicator, the Chrome extension. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's just like automatic. Like when I'm browsing through the newsfeed, I usually only go on Facebook to check messages, but then the newsfeed just catches me and my unconscious. I go into like zombie mode and just scroll, scroll. <laughs> but with Facebook newsfeed eradicator, it's just fantastic. It just gets rid of your newsfeed on your desktop. And yeah, like it saved me. It has. Um, so that's one one cool tool. Um, yeah, I think that's like a nice gentle approach. Like if deleting Facebook doesn't work for you and you find yourself on it next day, then just maybe start with uh, Eradicator. Uh, nice gentle transition. Um, heck, and I had, ah, oh, I thought I had another one. Maybe that's it. Facebook needs to be Eradicator and, and mind blank. <laughs> Complete mind blank. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. 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 Newsfeed is eradicated. That's an awesome one. Um, yeah. Like there's just, you can't scroll. It's just empty. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I haven't, I haven't seen a newsfeed on Facebook in forever, mm. which is good. Brilliant. Let's, uh, let's talk about your experience, uh, with loneliness, Matt. What's your experience with loneliness and, and sort of finding ways to deal with that to become more connected? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's really easy to, especially when you're running a business online to do nothing but that and to just do nothing but that, <laughs> right? Like, it's, uh, you know, especially when you're hustling, you got to get bills paid and you've got to grow and um, all that. It's very easy to just spend all of your waking hours behind a laptop. And that also is very dangerous and alienating, right? Because you can't replace the human experience and the human touch and human interactions and uh you know for me like i have always been very social um but you know when you add different variables into the mix like starting a business online and moving to a sp spanish speaking country yeah. um it's very easy to disconnect and alienate yourself um, so like, for example, when I first moved to Columbia, I did nothing but work. Like I, I mean, I was booking like pretty solid 10, 12, 14 hour days, most days of the week, because I was just, I had nothing to do, but figure out how to get some clients in. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, that's uh, a tough place to be because you have no sort of, release of that of that tension and energy and you know just kicking it and talking with a friend and like having a meaningful conversation can do wonders for you know your your spirit and your energy Absolutely. um and you know like i've definitely fallen into two patterns and traps where i would just do nothing but work yep. and I've had to be very conscious of that and, you know, cause I love, I love what I do. Um, but that's also like, that's also dangerous because people use that as an excuse not to be social and like not to do anything but work. And they're like, Oh, but I love it. I love it. I love it. But it's like, yeah, but who's in your life, right? Like, do you just have your laptop? Like that's not, I I'm sure that's not, everything that you want, you know, yeah. and not, every, not just want, but need. So yeah, you know, that's, that's happened. Like, and again, especially when you don't really speak Spanish and you can get delivery food on Rappi in Colombia, um, you know, you can just post up and, and do nothing, but being conscious and making time every, every week, ideally every day to be social and to break out of the routine a little bit uh, and have some human interaction has just been, you know, really powerful. And it's important because again, 
when we're disconnected, that's when we can, it leads us to those other paths that are destructive, you know? What about you? Mm, cool. Um, yeah, probably the loneliest point was when I actually, yeah, reconnected with you again when I was in uh, Malaysia. And I was staying in this, like, weird-ass capsule hotel, you know, completely deserted, off the cuff, out of nowhere, Timbuktu place in Malaysia called Malacca. And uh, I just thought, why not? This will be a fun adventure as a digital nomad type thing. And like, no one's really gone to Malacca. Maybe I'll we'll uncover the next digital nomad hotspot or something, or just a new experience really at the end of the day. And um, turned out to be a complete nightmare. And like the environment there was just, just, just loneliness. It was the epitome of a lonely city, uh, particularly for me too. So like everything, everything was like, I, I mean, I already felt lonely, but it, the, the environment that I put myself into, like it really brought it out. Uh, so this was another pretty intense episode where, yeah, I was literally sleeping in a cube. I thought, oh, that looks cool. Let's try it out. At the time I was running a, a sleep YouTube channel for a little while, short stint, learning all about sleep. And I'm like, let's try one of these sleep hotels, see how it affects my sleep. I got my aura ring on tracking my sleep. And I, I'm literally in this tiny box, like a, a coffin almost, like very small, just a, a small single mattress, a pillow, and low ceilings, that's it. And so I just locked myself up in this like prison cell, essentially. <laughs> that's where I would sleep. And so on top of that, you've got this deserted city called Malacca in Malaysia, which is three hours south of Kuala Lumpur. There's really not much going on there. It's like this old ancient city that's trying to modernize itself, uh, like in the last 10 years. Mm. So you've got like throughout the city, there's this really weird distribution where half of the buildings are scattered and they're old and just really old and ancient. And then the other half is, is just construction of these giant modern skyscrapers growing up. But there's like no one there. Like you just find crows squawking with like moldy chips and rags and weeds in their mouth. And they go, rah, rah. like it's the most deserted isolating place i've ever been to um <laughs> that was just my experience yeah mm. it was crazy and the beaches like the coastline it was like all polluted and there was no one there and you couldn't swim the beaches because it was that bad they had no swimming signs because there was just no clear entry to a sandy beach which i'm used to in australia so i'm a bit spoiled growing up in australia with our beaches but going to that I was oh like, yeah wow big transition but yeah the whole city had this eerie like character to it Plus, um, there's quite a, a, a big like a Muslim population there. And um, I just seeing a lot of people in burqas, uh, nothing against, uh, we're not going to dive into religion and all that stuff. But all I'm saying is like going into an environment where it feels like I'm kind of from another, I don't know, from another group or whatever. Like everyone's in burqas and I'm the only one that's not in a burqa. It just, I felt kind of like out of place, just, just plopping myself there in the city, just out of the blue. And so there was that factor too. And um, yeah, it's just strange, deserted. I woke up to crows squawking and um, like that just, and in this little tiny cube, like, uh, like what am I doing here? Like, why? <laughs> why did I think this was a good decision? But anyway, I quickly addressed my self-talk and said, okay, well, I didn't know that at the time. Uh, so fair enough, here I am. But yeah, like that, that transmuted into, it all came out in the form of, just oh it was bad like i was bringing mcdonald's and kfc and things back to my little cubicle and munching on it while playing world of warcraft i reignited my subscription for the next 14 days to just take myself all out of it and um yeah that was that was when i, I forgot how we reconnected exactly but we, we did hop on a skype call and, and um, yeah some positive shifts started happening from there and uh, I realized that, yeah, like loneliness, that needs to be addressed. And so I made plans with my friend Philip to go and live in South Korea together for a month and then in Thailand for another month. And uh, yeah, as soon as I touched down in uh, South Korea and made that decision, made that action and moved in with Bill as roommates, like, yeah, there was a nice relief off my shoulders. And um, yeah, then that just left a bit of the existential, I'm kind of lost with business, I don't know my direction anymore. So then at least I didn't have to deal with both because uh, that was pretty tough. But then, yeah, I sort of solved one, then the next one came. And now, like, ultimately, I'm in a fantastic place, never been better, it's funny. 
waves. But yeah, that was my experience mm -hmm. with loneliness. Um, do be aware of it. It tends to manifest as it could be booze, it could be video games for a lot of you, like when you're doing 15 hour streaks on Hearthstone, Overwatch, Call of Duty, whatever it is. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it might be a time to take a step back and go, hey, like, why am I doing this? Am I doing this because it's fun and this is what I like to do? I'm going to become a Twitch streamer or whatever. Or is it actually because there's a root issue and this is escapism? So, uh, yeah, that's when I think it's a good sign that there's something, it's probably loneliness. I think that's a big one amongst video gamers I'm talking about specifically. Um, so, yeah, it's time to address that. And so, yeah, the way I addressed it, I think I was pretty simple. It's like, okay, let's spend more time with my friends. So I decided to make a plan to hang out with Philip and actually live with him like every day. So I had that everyday interaction, not just once a month, you know, like you need yeah. your brain is like wired, like it's, it's deep in there. Like we get so much energy and goodness from connecting with wonderful people. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's my, my stick, my stitch. What do we call it? My stick. <clears throat> yeah. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, just meaningful conversations that, you know, like what we're doing now, just go a little deeper than usual. That is just not the programmed. Hey, what's up? Good. Nice. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, like that's a very, I don't know. I think it's a global thing. Even in Colombia, they, they just are like, Oh, como estas? Que tengas un buen día. Okay. Gracias. It's just like robot, robot, robot. And, uh, you know, it's all done with, like, really good energy, but um, it's just like, hey, let's go a little deeper. Let's have some meaningful uh, connection here. So, yeah, well, quite the uh, promotion of Malacca, Malaysia. Shout out to Malacca. <laughs> there you go. Uh, if, you, if you don't want to – if you want to go somewhere where you – just want to be lonely, then maybe that's your city. <laughs> a place to go, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Right. Dope. Cool. Um, yeah, cool. Well, let's start rounding it up, I guess. Um, yeah, chances are we'll probably do some more calls like this in the future. So anyone listening, if you, you found this video valuable, uh, let us know in the comments, like, what, what did you resonate with? I really want to hear. We both want to hear. We'll be checking the comments. Um, yeah. and I will also, Matt, I'll include any links you have to like uh, different hunger and, uh, what you got going on there. That's awesome. So I'll pop that in, uh, in the description below. Uh, yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to mention? Otherwise I think we'll, yeah, we'll wrap up and, and continue our days. Yeah. I mean, yeah. First of all, thank you, Brandon, for having me here and, uh, for opening up and, you know, being very vulnerable and honest with me and your uh, audience. Uh, I think it's really going to help a lot of people and I'm excited to, you know, do, do more of this. And uh, yeah, you know, we, you know, we, we definitely have other things that we want to share and, and cover. So, you know, by all means, let us know anything you guys are struggling with in the comments um, you know, anything that maybe you want us to, to cover, uh, and discuss further. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll probably do another video or two, um, about some of these topics, kind of like the, you know, the underground that we really want to make, uh, a lot more common, you know, like we want to make it normal to talk about depression and struggles and all these things because it, it is normal. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, you know, uh, it was great to great experience and I look forward to the next one. Um, and then in the future video, I'll kind of share a little bit more about, you know, different hunger, what we're doing, um, the work we're doing with freelancers and agencies, more of the business side. But before we did any of that stuff, we just wanted to really touch on the personal side of things because really in our experience and uh, you know, in in our journey that's really been the most important thing uh as you i'm sure can deduce from what we've talked about so yeah i look forward to connecting with uh with the one percent audience and thank you so much brandon for having me um but yeah it's been really fun all right awesome thank you matt and uh i'll see you guys in the comments